Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Now, loving God, send your Holy Spirit down upon us, that hearing your word we might understand it, and that understanding your word we might go forth and do it. Amen. Well, sometimes we are asked to do things that turn into mountainous tasks. Some years ago, my spouse Allison and I were expecting our first grandchild. That's how you know this is going to be a day about family. Our first grandchild was on the way. And of course, along that path of pregnancy, family and friends can be helpful, want to be helpful, seek out ways to be helpful. But it appears that time got away from them. Our grandchild's mother was a little isolated in the community. She kept saying everything was fine. But it occurred finally to somebody eight months into her pregnancy that it would be great for family and friends to offer her a surprise baby shower. Nothing like that had happened up to that point. And by surprise, I mean that it was a surprise to more than the expectant mother. It was a surprise to all of us. The idea came up with six days' notice. <laughs> there were reasons that this shower had to happen quickly. And yes, everyone thought everyone else had already thought of it. So there was a lot of scrambling and rearranging of schedules because everyone agreed it was such a great idea, not to mention a necessary one. Our little community of family and friends pulled together, and another person who was just a little more organized than the planner <clears throat> made phone calls and handed out assignments, and so began the saga of the diaper cakes. You've all seen a diaper cake, haven't you? No? Well. I'm afraid that a diaper cake is just what it sounds like. It's three tiers, sometimes four, with a little centerpiece on the top, of little newborn-sized diapers, sometimes, sometimes diapers for older children, if you can get them. But they're all wrapped neatly into tiers, stuffed together so that they stand on end, and the tiers build on each other, and you make little decorations, and they all have to be tied together so they don't fall apart. That's a diaper cake. And Allison and I were tasked with providing 14 diaper cakes, the centerpieces for the tables. Allison, being Allison, did the research, pulled together all the raw materials. Costco was very happy. And then we found ourselves rolling and stacking tiny, little, itty-bitty newborn diapers, turning them into three-layer cakes. Turns out that that was pretty tough work to be doing on such short notice. It stretched into the nights, six nights, where we were up past midnight every night still trying to see the thread that was holding all of these little itty bitty tiny diapers together. But they did have Elmo on top, so that was nice. <laughs> when the day arrived and the final thread was knotted and trimmed, we were both exhausted and relieved. Fourteen diaper cakes had been carefully stuffed into Allison's Jeep. And when she returned home that evening, we celebrated our freedom. <laughs> and until telling you the story this morning, I had forgotten just how hedged in we felt, how under pressure, how hard it was to even sleep, knowing we had a deadline to meet, to provide 14 centerpieces for 14 tables, 14 diaper cakes. Of course, diaper cakes, when it comes right down to it, are no big deal, especially when we consider some of the truly big deals in our lives that hedge us in. Many of those big deals are conflicts between how we wish things were and how 
they actually are. There can be conflicts that arise in how we make a living. We may wish that we could simply do our work unfettered, receive a living wage for it. But we may actually found our, find ourselves bound in our work, bound by unreasonable demands, bound by tasks that bother our consciences, bound by the nature of the work that may bring us into conflict with people we'd rather not even meet, let alone have to deal with, bound by expectations that our gifts and our talents can never truly meet. And so we can be bound up and hedged in in our work and think there is no end in sight. There's conflict at times in how we envision health and happiness. We may be wishing for perfect health for ourselves and for those we love, that we may not have to deal with pain, deal with accessibility, deal with vision. But we may actually find ourselves consumed with worry for someone we love facing a grave illness, consumed with worry for our own ability to enjoy life unhindered by pain or fatigue. And so we can be bound up in our worry about health and think there is no change in sight. There can be conflict and binding in the values we hold. We may believe strongly in values like universal justice, values like fairness in our dealings with one another, in values like respect and dignity, taking for granted that everyone knows what we mean by that and everybody shares those values. And in actuality, we may find ourselves distressed and alarmed that when we discover that values that we understand a certain way may mean something entirely different to the people we live in society with. We may be distressed and alarmed and we witness great injustices perpetrated in the name of the very same values we uphold. And so we can be bound up in our distress. We can sink into despair and in action. Those are big deals. And when we are caught up in a big deal, it can consume us. The horizon closes in. We start to conclude that nothing will ever change, that our life doesn't really have an influence on the things that are binding us. And things become reduced to the point where putting one foot in front of the other becomes our measure of getting through our days. Sometimes we can be so caught up in how things are that offers of help, of assistance, of hope seem shallow and weak. When we hear voices offering plans for change and relief, campaigning to have us follow them into a better future. Voices that claim power over the conditions that bring us despair. Voices that promise that things can be different. Voices that tell us that they understand what we go through. When we're bound up, our first reaction is to seek proof. We ask questions. Who are you? And how do you know me? How do I know that you share the same values I do? How do I know that you understand the pain I endure every day? How do I know that I can trust you? We want proof that those voices are not just more 
more of the same. We want proof that the voices we hear are being spoken by people who have a connection to who we are and how things are for us. And so we find Moses, we find Moses wanting to know just who it is that's offering help to the Israelites enslaved in Egypt. It's not like God doesn't know how to get Moses' attention. There's that bush burning without being consumed. A commentator wondered, just how long was that bush burning before Moses happened to notice it? But eventually Moses gets his mind off the flock and says, hey, that's different. (laughs) That's really different. Moses, who has escaped a burden, burdensome work situation, does notice. You know the burdensome work situation. Moses, who is a people of the is a person of the Israelites, has been taken up and raised by the Egyptians, has been placed as an overseer to one of the work gangs that's spoken of in today's scripture reading gets into an argument with one of the Israelites, strikes him with his staff, and kills the man. Moses runs away, fearful that he's going to be either tried by the Egyptians for what he's done, or torn limb from limb by the slaves whom he has offended. And now he's tending sheep. And Moses notices that God is trying to get his attention. And his big question isn't, why are you doing this, but why are you doing it to me? Why are you flashing this burning bush in front of me? And who are you anyway? Moses struggles with being singled out, and who can blame him? Moses carries the knowledge that he's not an Egyptian, but another Israelite, and that the Israelites could very well hate him. There's no way he wants to go back to Egypt, even if a voice from a burning bush tells him to, especially if a voice from a burning bush tells him to go. So Moses wants proof. Moses wants proof that he's talking to someone who can help. Moses raises the impossibility of the task that the voice is giving to him. Why would those Israelites listen to me anyway? I've offended them. I look like an Egyptian to them. I look like someone who can't be trusted to them. Why should they listen to me? And he demands to know, and who exactly is it who's sending me? Why should I listen to this voice that maybe I'm hallucinating? Moses wants to know who he's talking to. Moses wants a name. Where Moses wants a name, God offers something better than that. God offers a relationship. When God says, and I like the way you said this, Ken, I am who I am, God is basically saying, asking my name is the wrong question. I bet you want to know. I bet you'd like to find out. But I simply am. But when God says, I am the same one who was known by Abram and Isaac and Jacob, that is God saying, we have been in relationship, you and me, for a very long time. We were in relationship when your very first ancestor was reeling off names for everything that breathed and moved. We were in relationship 
when Abraham was despairing of descendants and Sarah laughed in delight for the baby that was born to her. We were in relationship when Jacob wrestled with an angel. We were in relationship when Joseph's brothers traded him into Egypt. We were in relationship when the tribes of your ancestors were enslaved. We were in relationship when you, Moses, got ensnared in your troubles and you thought there was no way out. And through our relationship, our connection, I will lead you out of it. And through our relationship, you will find the way forward. I'm not a name. I am with you. I know you. And when we feel entrapped in the kind of big deal in which Moses was ensnared, when we feel entrapped by a big deal, God doesn't offer us a name. God offers us relationship. Not an offer of magic or miracles, though we've experienced both. Rather, a covenant reminder that empowers us to reach out in faith a covenant reminder that encourages us to raise our eyes from the despair in which we find ourselves. A covenant reminder that helps us see other possibilities in the big deals that trap us. Helps us see that in God's relationship with us, we are perfectly accepted and forgiven. We are not alone. Because I am is with us. You are not alone today. You are not by yourself. Even as you face whatever it is that may bind you, you have company. You have companionship. You have assurance that God is with you, that God understands you, that God embraces you, that God is in relationship with you. May that assurance be your strength in the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us be in silent meditation.